In this video, we're going to take a look at using automated modeling as a starting shape for generative design fluids. Hey everyone, this is Matt with Learn Everything About Design, and in this video, we're not going to do a slow step-by-step how-to like I normally do, but instead we're going to hit some top-level topics on automated modeling for starting shapes and generative design fluids, as well as a little bit at the end on post-processing your generative design and what the difference really is between automated modeling and generative design. So in this case, what we're doing is we're taking a look at generative design fluid, specifically two inlets going to one outlet. Now there are some limitations with generative design fluid. It is still in preview, so it is free to solve and use. So if you have a commercial or an education license, you can access it and it does not cost any cloud credits. Generative design for structural, however, is a little bit different. That does still require cloud credits to solve. There is a seven day trial where you can get unlimited solves. So if you're looking to try it out, do that, but I suggest that you plan out your models and do some research ahead of time. Now, I have done a lot of courses on generative design on the Autodesk website and I Strongly suggest that if you're learning generative design and if you want a complete course that you do go there. Uh, however, I'm going to cover a couple of points here about GD fluid specifically. So let's talk about what generative design is and how it's different from automated modeling. So first, you're going to take a look at loads and constraints. This is something automated modeling does not have. Automated modeling is only looking at connecting a couple of different bodies together. So we're first looking at loads and constraints. We're also looking at different materials. So if we're talking about generative design for structural, we can take into account different materials and manufacturing methods, things like 3D printing. We can do two axis cutting, two and a half, three and five axis machining. We can do casting. And we have an unrestricted method, which basically just doesn't take a look at any restrictions and allows it to build the most ideal shape based on your inputs. It also can take a look at multiple load cases. So when we're looking at loads and constraints, think about a design like a bookshelf. You might place a weight on the bookshelf, you might bump into it, you might push up on it. These are all different load cases and generative design can take into account all of the different loading scenarios and solve for that ideal case. Again, automated modeling is only looking at generating the geometry. So in this, case, we're going to talk about why we might use automated modeling for generative design fluid specifically. Now, GD Fluid has been out for a little over a year now uh, in preview, and it really likes to have a starting shape. It needs a starting shape to know where it can build. Mechanical generative design is okay as long as we have line of sight between the preserved regions. If we don't have line of sight, then we need to start thinking about adding that starting shape. But for GD fluid, it is in 99% of the cases you are going to want to have a fluid starting shape. So we're going to use automated modeling to do that. And to get started, we're going to go to automate. And again, this is a preview feature still. Uh, it's not available in a hobby license, but if you're commercial or if you're education license, you will have access to it. So we're going to do faces to connect. And this is one area where I wish this tool was different. So when we look at faces to connect, we either have to select the planar face on this or we have to select the outside cylindrical face. I would love if we could select an edge instead of a face to connect because then we could drive the tangency. So this isn't really going to give us a great option for uh, the build volume, but we'll talk about that a little bit. And then we have some bodies to avoid. I don't want to build out away from these, so I'm going to use this as an avoidance and I want it to go through the center here. So. We're basically going to select those as um, bodies to avoid, and we're going to generate those shapes. Now, if you've been playing around with this, depending on the complexity of your setup, it can take anywhere from a few minutes to, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes, probably at the max. It doesn't really take that long compared to solving a generative study. So it is a great first step to build out that starting shape. What I am also going to do is I'm going to take a look at using this automated modeling starting shape, but I'm also going to manually make a starting shape so that way we can look at the difference in the solves and how one might affect it. And again, what we're looking at here is two collectors going into one outlet. Again, there are some limitations with GD fluid while mechanical does have symmetry and it has some other things that we can do. Fluid right now is not really looking at 
multiple inlets and outlets. You can do multiple inlets in a single outlet, but um, it oftentimes does not really like that. So, uh, so this is kind of a, a case where we are ensuring that we have symmetry in the model. I know that everything is symmetric because these bodies are mirrored and that's gonna work okay for us. But just keep in mind that it's, it's not as robust. All right, so you can see here, we've already got some solutions being generated. Uh, alternative one is starting to generate. It's not completed yet. And we've got some others that are cranking away. So let's go ahead and check back in once these are all done. All right, so you can see we now have all of our alternatives. We've got one, two, and three, and these are all the smooth transitions. And then four, five, and six are going to be the hard transitions. So when we talk about transitions, we're looking at basically this squared portion. So if we look at number two, this is a smooth transition out of that face, and number five is a square transition. So depending on which one you choose, it's, it's not gonna make that much of a difference, but it is important to note that these shapes will have an effect on the overall generative design solution. So you'll note that we have our obstacle here, and it sort of built this out in a way, and then it connected it with this form body. So it's not really looking at the, the entire face. It's sort of using that minimal transition there. And you can also see in this case, it happened to create some weird feature where it's, it's sort of got this like spike or sharp corner here. And that's not ideal either. Uh, and these are all things that can be fixed by modifying the forms. And I did a video on that, so we're not gonna talk about it here. But what I wanna do is I wanna talk about manually building a starting shape as well. So I'm gonna hide that body and I'm gonna build my own starting shape. And the way that I'm gonna do this is I need to connect to each of these faces. So I'm just gonna to go to a top view because everything is symmetric here. I'm gonna use project and I'm gonna just project these outside faces. This is gonna give me a straight line to work with. And then I'm just gonna build out the rest of this box I'm not gonna worry as much about that obstacle because it's not really a big deal uh, in terms of the generative design. It's not really a big deal because it'll still take into account that obstacle. I'm just gonna go ahead and extrude this up and that goes up two inches. We'll make it symmetric on the other side and I'm not gonna join it. I am gonna go ahead and use it as a new body. So uh, again, this is gonna be sort of my, my starting point. Now there's some weird stuff going on here. You can see there's like this phantom edge there. That's okay. It's not really going to affect us too much. But at this point, I'm going to go ahead and save, and then I'm going to move into generative design. So in generative design, we have two choices, structural component, which is looking at our linear static stress. So it's a static case, but we could have multiple load cases. And again, we can talk about things like fabrication method, if it's machined or if it's cast or if it's unrestricted or 3D printed. But fluid path is really a lot more straightforward because we're either looking at air, water, or some custom fluid, and we're looking at inlets and outlets. We're not looking at multiple materials. We're not looking at multiple load cases or any load cases for that matter, other than the fluid flow. So we're gonna create this fluid path. It is required to solve on the cloud, but once again, this is currently in preview. Now, currently it's uh, July 22nd, so uh, it, it's been in preview for almost a year. I don't um, anticipate that it's gonna go out of preview anytime soon. Could be wrong there, but uh, it is still free to use at this point. So if you're education or commercial, then you can get access to this without having to use cloud credits. So now that we're in here, we need to talk about the generative design workspace because it is a little bit different. Now, Fluid versus structural is also different. There are more options at the top. So we're really gonna focus on fluid here because that's what we're doing. But the browser and the general workflow is still gonna be the same. So when we look at the browser, we have a generative model. And underneath the model, we have our model components. These are our solid bodies, our com components in the design, depending on the structure of your design. And you can see that we've got our starting shape here. We've got our other starting shape inside. We've got our um, boundaries, our obstacles and preserves, all the different things that we need. And you'll notice below that we've got our study, study one fluid path, which contains our preserve and an obstacle geometry. Now these are things that we wanna keep, things that we wanna avoid. We've got our starting shape and we've got this unassigned section. Now the unassigned section, this is going to be where things have not gone into these other buckets yet. 
Below that, we have our objectives. Um, there's not really much in the way of objectives for fluid flow. We have the minimize and pressure drop, which is the default. And then we also have a limit. So this is going to be a target percent of the volume, of the original volume. And then we've got our load cases. These are things like fluid flow and boundary conditions. So again, there's not that much here compared to a structural, uh, a structural generative design, but there are a couple things that we want to do. The first thing that we want to do is note that under study, we've got study settings. Now, the study settings has synthesis resolution. If you're in a structural study, there are a couple other options, things like alternative solves, and there are some remove rigid body modes and things like that. But in here, all we have is this coarse and fine. Now, what this is doing is it's changing the number of mesh elements that are getting created in that build volume. The higher the slider goes toward fine, the smaller the elements will be the longer it's gonna to take to solve. The lower it goes towards coarse, the larger those elements will be, and the shorter time it'll take to solve. It's still solved on the cloud. You probably won't notice much of a difference until you get drastically close to either end. But just keep in mind that playing around with the slider will have an effect on your solve time. Now, if you're not sure what these element size really represent, when we're talking about finite element analysis, we're talking about solving across each of these cells. Think of, think of them as little cubes that make up the model. Now in some simulation programs, we can have different types of shell elements. We don't have control over that here. So you just have to really think about converting your design to a mesh, mesh elements, and how big or small those are gonna be. So we're gonna leave it right in the middle for this example. Next is edit model. And edit model is going to be the area where you can model any of your components. You can simplify your design. You can do things like remove faces and features. And none of the stuff that gets done here affects the model in the design workspace. So you can add a bunch of bodies, you can remove them, you can change them, and it doesn't have any effect on the original design. It's all contained here within a generative model. And there are a couple tools that are new. And we have things like connector obstacle, which is specific to generative design. But we have other things like fluid volume. We have remove features and remove faces. These are tools that you can get access to in the design workspace. Some of them like fluid volume will show up when you turn off your design, capture design history. Some of them can be turned on in the, pre, in the properties of the program. So you can go to your user preferences and you can enable certain tools. Uh, so these are available in edit model. They're also available when you're doing simulation studies in uh, Simplify. And some of them are available in the manufacturer models in CAM. So uh, just note that they do pop up and there are different things that you might wanna do like replace a certain body with a primitive if it's only gonna be used as an obstacle, you don't need a ton of detail. So now that we have seen the basic approach to setting up the model, let's talk about a generative model and what that really means. So a generative model contains the studies and all the settings to run the study. If you have multiple general generative models, that means you're going to change geometry. And when you change geometry, you're gonna to have to solve an entirely new study. Now, again, this is currently free, it's in preview, so that doesn't matter. But if you're using a structural generative design, that's gonna cost you, I think, 35 cloud credits each time you solve. So it is important that you think downstream what you want in terms of your geometry. For this example, I do wanna solve two generative models. So I'm gonna start by cloning this. So we'll right click and clone it. It's gonna bring in the study, but I haven't actually populated the study yet. So it's not gonna make much of a difference. And then what I wanna do is go into my model components, my bodies, and in the second study, I want to keep this new starting shape that I created. So body 13, I'm gonna right click and remove. Then I'm gonna activate generative model one. I'm gonna go into my model components, into the bodies, and I'm gonna remove that larger starting shape. Once again, this only affects the generative design generative model. If I go back and forth between those, you can see that the bodies are actually changing. If we go back to the design workspace, they're still the same. So now that we're in here, I'm gonna activate generative model one, and we're gonna set this first one up, and then I'm gonna set the, the second one up exactly the same. So the first thing that we need to do is figure out what regions we wanna preserve. Now, if you're used to doing CFD studies, you'll understand what lids are. Now, lids are going to be the areas where we've got fluid coming in or going out of our simulation study. 
So in our case, I have these lids that were created, which represent the inside body. Now, keep in mind that in some surface or some programs you can use surfaces. In Fusion, we're going to want these to be solid bodies. The thickness doesn't matter, but we want them to be solid bodies. Next, we want to talk about the areas that we want to avoid. So these obstacles are going to be things like this big plate. We want to go through it in the center. I'm also going to select these outside areas outside of those uh, preserve regions, those lids, because I don't want to allow it to build outward. I want it to just start to go toward the, the end goal. So I'm going to say OK. And then last, we need to select our starting shape. Now, as I mentioned, structural GD is not as picky about a starting shape. But when you're doing fluid, you really want to give it a starting shape because it's looking at a path between the inlets and the outlets, between these shapes. And structural GD is really looking more at line of sight and connecting those preserves and then validating it through high and low areas of stress concentration. So we're going to say OK to the starting shape for this. And then we need to determine our fluid conditions. Now currently, again, this is in preview. It's been in preview for a little while, but currently we have some limitations that we need to follow when we're talking about our flow source and our outlet. Now, the first thing that we want to do is we want to select the outside of these faces, even though they're solid and even though in reality the fluid is going to be on the inside of that, it's not really looking at that. What we're focusing on is those arrows, those, the direction of those arrows. If we put it on the other side, it will still solve, but it'll give you an error about boundary conditions and you won't get the same number of iterations. So what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that we set this as either a flow rate or a flow velocity. This is going to represent fluid coming into our system. I'm going to change the units. In this case, I'll do CFM. And I'm just going to do 150 CFM and say OK. The next thing that we need to do is we need to determine what the out condition is. Now, the way to do that in GD fluid currently is to set it for pressure to select that face and have it set at, in this case, zero PSI. It doesn't matter the units because zero PSI is zero megapascals. So we're just gonna set it at zero and now we have our outlet condition. Now, the last time I played with this, you were not able to do a fluid flow in and out with different numbers. It really wanted to have a zero PSI drop at that outlet. Now that might've changed if somebody uses this often and and knows if that's changed, then please let me know. But as of the time that I'm doing this, that's, that's the way that I'm gonna work it with zero PSI on the outlet. So now this GD study is all set up. Now, in reality, what would have been easiest is to go into edit model and clone generative model one. And this will bring in all the information with that simulation study. If I go into my model components into bodies, I can delete the remove from the timeline and then I can remove this other starting shape and I can finish the model and then if I take a look at generative model three you can see that I've got a warning for the starting shape and that's because the starting shape has changed so this time I just need to reselect a different starting shape so now I've got all of the simulation studies set up exactly the same with the exception of the starting shape if you want to get rid of generative model two, you can go back into the edit model workspace. You can right click and you can delete it. And then we can just stick with number one and number three. So now each of these only have one fluid path study. As I mentioned before, you can have multiple load cases and multiple studies when you're talking about structural designs. With the fluid path, it's really best to just do a single study and a single load case, at least right now. That's what I found is you, you really just want to focus on one condition and a steady state condition, which is generally what you would do with fluid flow anyways. So now that we have these all set up, notice that the pre-check in this generate area says that we have everything that's required. However, we didn't tell it what material we wanted and we didn't tell it any of the objectives. So let's double check those. By default, it's going to minimize pressure drop. That's the only option for us. And the limits are going to be based on target volume. This is where the difference between our two starting shapes is going to come into play because they're obviously different volumes. So we can think about making a change in the percent of design volume. You can see the target volume here for this one is 1.3 times 10 to the sixth. If I go back to generative model one, 
you can see that this one is 2.9 times 10 to the fifth. So what we could do is we could increase this one to say 50 or even uh, 75 and get them a little bit closer to the same number. But it really just depends again on your starting shape. It depends on your setup and your criteria. The other thing that we need to talk about is the material. Now we have water and air, which are predefined. And then we have a custom option where we can determine things like the density and the viscosity. For this example, I'm going to assume that it's air and I'm gonna do the same thing for generative model three. I'm gonna go into material and just select air as my option. So once again, these are all ready to go. I'm gonna click generate. I'm gonna select both of them. Once again, currently free because it's in preview. There's no cloud credits required to solve this. So I'm gonna generate both studies. The amount of time it takes to generate these studies is going to vary depending on your input. It's gonna depend on the resolution of your study and also the number of studies you're trying to solve. So this is gonna take a good bit of time, but one thing that's interesting about generative design is as each iteration begins to get solved, the Explorer will pop up and you can actually watch it in real time as it goes through the iterations. Not really a good use of time, but we can check back in once we have all of the, the two different generative models solved and we can see what the results are. All right, now that we have some completed studies, we can take a look. So we've got study one, which is completed, and notice that there is a problem. It says that there is, uh, basically it says it failed to complete an outcome. And then over here, we also have a problem. It says that it failed to complete an outcome. Now, what that generally means is that the number of iterations didn't go all the way to the end. We have 14 here, which is fine. Usually I would expect to see between 10 and 30. And uh, so I'm happy with seeing this. When we first take a look at study three, this was the one that had the larger starting shape. So this larger starting shape, I wanna sort of identify a few things. One, I wanna identify that it is not symmetric. So we can see that on the left-hand side, as we're looking at it, we have a very nice gradual shape, but on the right-hand side, it sort of bulges out and sort of works its way around. If we take a look at the flow lines, it looks, relatively consistent. It's a little bit higher on the left-hand side in terms of the velocity magnitude than the right. So again, not exactly symmetric, not even on both sides. In this case, if we take a look at the pressure reference, you can see that it is different from left to right, which is interesting because we use the same input conditions on this side and different ones on this side. The purple box allows us to change between the design preview and the mesh preview. The design preview is going to give us a little bit better indication of what the outcome is going to look like once we convert it to a design. So we can see here that we've got these preserve regions and the uh, boundary is coming from the outside and it's sort of working its way around and going in. If we look at the flow lines, the flow lines are coming in here. So that's really not an indication of what's happening inside of that little corner, but the way the geometry works, it's kind of what we have. If I finish this and I take a look at the other one, we can compare them together. So if we select both, we can uh, compare the differences between the two. So again, we can see that we had a different starting shape and the end result is different, obviously, it's very different. So this one combined much later than this one here. You can see that the flow path is different when they're combined or compared to each other. The one on the right looks a bit more consistent. The one on the left has a lot of these high and low spots, which is not what I would expect to see. So with this, what I would say is, uh, my conclusion is that I probably wouldn't use automated modeling for a fluid starting shape. Uh, and that's just simply based on the fact that it's really going to restrict and pinch the design down, uh, potentially pinch the design down, at least in a case like this where we're going two to one. It's just not gonna give us a large enough volume to build from. Whereas the version where we just made a big sort of block and gave that as a starting shape, you can see that the flow path looks a lot smoother. Now, it's not symmetric, but that's something that we can still deal with. So now the question is, what do we do from here? So we have this, this last iteration. We can go back to any previous number of iterations. If we like an earlier version, it's perfectly fine for us to go back. This looks okay, and we can go up to 11, looks okay, 12, and so on. 
Um, but essentially the last iteration is usually going to be the best unless there, there happens to be some sort of separation that happens further down the line. You can always look at the properties, see if you're maintaining your criteria. It's more of a, an issue when you're talking about structural generative design with fluid. It's not really, um, there's not really a whole lot to look at, right? Where the pressure drop here should be relatively close to zero. And um, so that's, that's what we have here. So what I wanna do at this point is I want to convert this to a design I can work with. And we have two options. We can create a mesh or we can create a design. Now the design will give us a form body and we can ultimately turn that into a mesh if we wish. So that's the route that I usually go. The reason that you might select a mesh over doing the design is if you really like the way in which the mesh body wraps into those preserve regions. The preserve regions, when we look at the design, is going to be different than the mesh version. So it's just a simple fact of how this works. The per preserve regions get converted to mesh elements and combined with the rest of it. But when we convert it to a design, it ends up using the original bodies, in this case, the extruded cylinders that we had. So it is going to be slightly different between the two. But I like the design aspect because that gives me a form body I can manipulate. Because this looks so different from left to right, I'd likely split it in the middle and give it some sort of symmetry. So I think that's the route that I would go, work on just one side and sort of build it out. After the design is ready and we hop back into the design workspace, we'll talk about how we can manipulate it from there. But at this point, that is going to be the basic overview of setting up a generative design fluid study and using the automated model as our starting shape. Now, as I mentioned, with this example, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me to use that as a starting shape. It's a cool technique, maybe as it evolves and we have some more criteria that we can drive, might give us a better result. But right now it's just kind of restricting the volume in which it's looking to start that build. So again, we're gonna check back in once we have our design ready to convert. Sometimes this takes a couple minutes, sometimes it takes 15 or more. It kind of just depends on the complexity of the design. All right, now that our design is ready, all we need to do is click the green box and open the design in the design workspace. So with most generative design studies, just like the automated modeling, we're gonna get a form body, we're going to get a boundary fill, and we're gonna get a combine. Now, there are some exceptions to this if we're doing structural generative design with say two axis cutting, or even two and a half axis cutting, we'll end up getting a sketch and some extrude features. So there are, again, some differences, but for the most part, you're gonna get a form body. You'll notice that with the combine, a lot of times you'll end up with the obstacles slightly cutting into your final body. And that's why in generative design, inside of our settings, we have an option where we can actually create an offset of the obstacle. And that's intended to allow us to just simply give it a little bit of extra space to generate. So oftentimes what I'll do is I'll completely get rid of that last feature, that combine. You can suppress it or delete it. And you can see here, this corner is slightly overlapping. You could also modify this to round that off if you want, but again, we don't really need it. So uh, I'm just gonna get rid of it. The other thing that I oftentimes will do is I will modify the form body and then it's gonna break the boundary fill. But in most cases, whenever you're using a generative design study, you're either going to do one of two things. One is going to, well, actually one of three things we should say. One is going to be build a design based on the outcome. So you're gonna look at the results, you're gonna identify the ideal structure, in this case, fluid flow, fluid path, and then you're gonna build a design that's probably parametric in nature based off of that. The second thing is to use that design as is. So if you're 3D printing it, if you're gonna do a cast, then a lot of times you can just use that design. It'll be very organic. You might need to do a little bit of cleanup, but sometimes you might just want that exact design. We've seen that before with uh, Autodesk has done a bunch of these different generative design studies. They did it with uh, JPL, the Jet Propulsion Lab with a, a Mars Lander or Mars Rover. Um, they've done it with Volkswagen. There was a, a electric VW bus and all kinds of different, you know, different companies that have gotten on board with generative design. Then the last one is if you are going to spend some time cleaning up the form body itself. And that's the route that I normally take is I'll go in and I'll do some manual cleanup. And that's what we're gonna do here because one, I don't like the way that this transitions out of this shape. So I'm gonna talk about how to fix that. 
And I also just want to clean this up in general. So I'm going to roll back before the boundary fill and we're going to modify this feature. So we're going to edit that form body. Now the first thing I'm going to do is take this edge where it bulges out and just delete it. I get a warning. It says that it unfroze that edge. And honestly, I don't care because we're going to fix that anyway. So I'm just going to go through and delete some of these edges, just double clicking and hitting delete. And that'll just sort of clean up the transition and smooth it out for me. Uh, we could do the same thing on the other side. So we've got this little bump over here. We can clean some of this up and we can do it without affecting the frozen edges. So if you just want to clean up some of this, you can do that. And then we want to use the match tool to get this to line up. So modify, match, we're going to double click on our form edge. We are going to select the edge of our solid body. I'm going to make sure tolerance is turned on. And one thing you'll notice is a lot of these black dots get placed in between the white dots. Those are T points and those are getting added to get the shape as close as we can to that. Now, even with that, when we convert this, there will likely be a problem with boundary fill. In most cases, boundary fill wants to have that surface overlap. So if I select this and I select that piece, the, the center section, the form body, is not a green cell, which is telling me that it's not going to work. So the way that I get around this is I'm going to come into my surface tools and I'm going to create an offset of this inside face here. I'm going to go ahead and hide the preserves and just focus on these surfaces and I'm going to stitch them together. So once I stitch those together, if I bring back the boundary fill and modify it, now what I want to do is I want to clear out all these selections and I want to show these preserves, but this time I'm not going to bring that preserve in. I'm only going to use these two and this allows me to select the cells that I want. Now there is currently a problem I've noticed with the cell selection here. It will not let you select through a body. So you will have to rotate this around in order to grab that. And we can say, okay. And now we've turned that into a solid body. Now, again, these are all workarounds, but taking a little bit of time to clean up that form body is definitely going to be worth it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna continue to clean this up just a little bit so we can see the final outcome. All right, well, there we have it. It's, it's not perfect, but a little bit more work, and you can see that we've got a fairly smooth result. I would probably do uh, symmetry on this thing if I was gonna spend some more time, but uh, as you can see, we can take the form body, we can make some adjustments, we can smooth things out. Likely what uh, what's gonna end up happening is you're gonna have to spend a bit more time to get this thing to turn into a shell, a thin wall body. And you have to be careful of things like the radius that happens inside of these corners. So if I do uh, 0.01, something relatively thin, you can see that now we've got a thin wall body here based off of this. So again, it's kind of an interesting idea is to take an original design. So in this case, we took the automated modeling design to use as a preserve. And we also made our own preserve body, right? So we, we created our own version that was a little bit bigger and then we had an obstacle to go through. So what I would say uh, out of doing this experiment here is I would say that using automated modeling as a starting shape for, in this case, for our generative design fluid flow is not a good idea. Now, the main reason is that Essentially, it just doesn't give enough room to allow the software to build and look for uh, look for different answers. So if it were able to generate a larger volume, then I would say, yes, go for it. But this one here, it just it just doesn't have enough space. The geometry is not quite right. It instantly restricts how much of the what I'm going to call the lids, the faces where the flow is coming in or out of 
it instantly restricts how much of that we're using. So it just has some problems associated with it and it, it just doesn't make a good result. So I would suggest at this point in time is you can play around with automated modeling, create some organic shapes for your parts, but I probably wouldn't use it for at least a generative design fluid flow starting shape. I would still go in and make my own shape. And then of course you have to play around with the post-processing, figure out you know, what you want your final shape to look like. And that's all gonna come down to playing around with the form body and getting comfortable with those tools. At this point, again, this wasn't meant to be a step-by-step -step to go through the process, but I wanted to highlight at least a few of the main major points that we went through. So that was setting up the automated model to see if we could use it as some sort of starting shape, setting up a basic generative design fluid flow, talking a little bit about GD in general. Uh, if, if people are interested in this topic, I can go in and I can do some generative design videos if we wanna talk about structural stuff. But it is important to note that that is not free. That does take 35 cloud credits per solve unless you're using the seven day trial, uh, which everybody that's on a commercial or EDU account should be able to get access to that. If you are on a hobby account, I do not believe that, that you can get access to generative design. So if you do have any questions on that, please let me know if you do wanna see more on that. I can certainly cover that in future videos. But after we did the initial setup, we looked at the results of the generative design, in this case, fluid flow. We compared the version made with the automated model starting shape and then the, the larger volume that we created. And then we looked at the results as a form body and ultimately a solid body. And we just took a quick look at a couple of different ways that we can modify the design to sort of smooth it out and get a little bit better result. So at this point, that's as far as I'm gonna go with this. If anybody wants to see a full walkthrough on setting up a generative design study, I can certainly do that. But again, it does take a good bit of time and the solves do take a while. So if you are following along, keep in mind that you probably need to set aside one to two hours to come back after the solve is, is done. So it does take a good bit of time for that in most cases. But if you have any questions, please let me know. As always, thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.